Welcome to the Municipal Elections Guidance Webinar. This is Mickey Shields with the Iowa League of Cities, and we thank you for joining us for another edition in our 2017 webinar series. We hope you find this webinar helpful, along with other options in this year's series. You can also access archived webinars from previous webinar series on the League website at www.iowaleague.org. Before we begin, I want to first thank the League's endorsed programs for their continued support of city governments and the League. I also want to thank our sponsors of, of this webinar, Forecast 5 and MSA. We appreciate their involvement with the League and for helping cities across the state find successful solutions. To begin, I would like to go over a couple things about the webinar. The League's webinars are free to access and view on our website anytime. Any handouts are available on the website as well. Finally, please send any questions to the League and we will be happy to answer them. Later this year, cities around the state will hold elections for city council and mayoral seats. Done every two years, city elections provide citizens the ability to elect the leaders of their community. This important process involves many steps, from candidates filing nomination papers, to proper campaigns, to the election itself, and finally, when the new terms begin. In this webinar, we will offer guidance on the city's role in elections, nomination processes and filing periods for candidates seeking office, and some post-election tips. We will also go over what cities should be aware of when dealing with vacancies on their city council, as well as special elections, since those items can occur at any time of the year. We will then wrap up with an overview of campaign laws that candidates and city officials should understand. As I said before, city elections are held every two years in odd number of years. The actual election day is the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November, which lands on November 7th this fall. Well before then, cities are required to certify its nomination process to the county auditor. This year's deadline is August 9th, and we'll get into the different nomination processes a little later in the webinar. Most cities long ago established its nomination process and have never made a change, which is fine. However, if a city ever wishes to make a change, it must do so prior to 90 days before the next regular city election. Another basic thing to understand is who may serve on your city council. The state code requires those interested in serving as a council member or mayor to be a, quote, eligible elector which is defined as someone who is able to be a registered voter, although they are not required to be registered in order to run for office. Candidates must also be a resident of the city or ward for cities that use a ward system at the time of the election. Candidates and elected officials also cannot be disqualified from serving, which includes convicted felons, unless their rights have been restored by the governor or president. Cities do have uh, some specific duties as required by the state code uh, to carry out during the nomination and election processes. This includes the city clerk delivering any public measures or public referendums to the county auditor to be placed on the next ballot. Additionally, a law adopted in 2016 permits city clerks to be designated by the county auditor to receive nomination papers. Keep in mind, the default setting is for the county auditor only to receive nomination papers. Any cities wishing to be designated in this regard must get permission from their county auditor. For any cities that have a city clerk designated to receive nomination papers, the clerk's office must be open until 5 p.m. on the final day of the filing period and must deliver the nomination papers to the county auditor by noon the next day. Designated city clerks also must receive ob objections to candidate eligibility, which will be detailed, detailed later on when we're discussing the nomination processes. All city clerks must receive any notices of intent to contest an, ele an election, which must be filed within 10 days after the election. All clerks, along with the county auditor, may accept write-in winner resignations as well. City clerks are also re required to accept papers and serve as the filing officer for any special elections that occur throughout the year. There are a few other duties that may not be, pre be prescribed by the state code, 
but are still a good idea for cities to complete to help ensure the election is done well. This includes providing resources and information to candidates and the public. This may include nomination papers, campaign laws, and other pertinent information, as well as the League's Candidate Guide, which is available at www.iowaleague.org. And we also sent out several copies to each city earlier this spring, and those can be distributed to the public as each city deems fit. Cities should also be prepared to answer any questions regarding the nomination process and election. Citizens, candidates, members of the media, and others will naturally come into City Hall or call the city clerk for information on the upcoming city election. The clerk and others at the city should have the basics down to help answer any questions. We also encourage cities to use the city election planning worksheet and the city clerk's guide from the Iowa Secretary of State's office. Both are very helpful in making sure the city is fulfilling its election duties. Another important duty is to work closely with your county auditor. Even when it's not in a, a regular election year for cities, it's really important for cities to notify their auditor when a vacancy occurs on their council and when there may be a need for a special election. And when it is an election year like this year, communicating with the auditor is helpful so everyone is on the same page regarding which council seats are up for election. Believe me, it's easy to forget which seats are up and which are not since many cities use a staggered system for their council member terms. Now we'll cover nomination processes and there are four processes available to cities, each having its own requirements for an individual to be nominated for city office. We'll start with the primary election process, which is the default unless cities switch to another option. Under the primary election process, Candidates are nominated by petition, which must get signatures equal to at least 2% of the number of votes at the last city election, but not less than 10 signatures. The primary election is not always necessary, though, as one is only held if the number of candidates is more than twice the number of open seats. If that occurs, then the primary election is held a month before the regular election, which this year is October 10th. At the primary election, voters are allowed to choose up to the number of open seats to be elected at the regular election. Whoever receives the most votes at the primary election moves on to the regular election in November with the number being equal to twice the number of open seats to be filled. That may not be easy to follow, so we have a little example here. Uh, if you have two open council seats and five candidates file nomination papers for those seats, the primary election would narrow the field down to four candidates to appear on the regular, regular election ballot. Next up is the convention process, which is unique and nominate, nominates candidates through non-party political organizations, or NPPOs. Such conventions must be attended by at least 10 eligible electors, including at least one from half of the precincts in the city. Much more common is the nomination by, by petition process, where candidates are nominated by petition with the signatures required based on the population of the city. Candidates in cities less than 100 in population must get at least five signatures. Those in cities 100 to 3,499 must get at least 10 signatures, while anyone in cities 3,500 and over must get at least 25 signatures. Pretty straightforward. Lastly, cities may use the runoff election process, process, which has similar petition requirements as the primary election process. What is unique to this system is the possibility of a runoff election, which must be held if no candidate at the regular city election receives a majority of votes. In that scenario, the runoff election is held one month after the regular election, which this year would be December 5th. Under each of the four processes we just described, Candidates must also complete an affidavit for candidacy, which must state the individual's name, the individual's residence, that the individual is eligible for the office they seek, and that if, if, if the individual is elected, they will qualify for the office. Moving on to filing periods, there are two sets of schedules, one for primary election cities and another for the runoff, convention, and petition processes. As seen on the slide, the filing period for candidates in primary election cities opens August 14th this year and closes August 31st. Candidates may submit their nominations, any pa papers, anytime during this period. For all other cities, the candidate filing period begins August 28th 
it ends September 21st this year. Anyone may submit an objection to a candidate's nomination and objections must be submitted in writing to the county auditor or designated city clerk. Objections in cities with primary elections must be submitted by September 5th this year, while in all other cities the deadline is September 26th. After an, object, uh, an objection is filed, a hearing must be held within one week, or in cities with primary elections, the hearing must be held within 24 hours. Hearings are done by the mayor, city clerk, and a council member chosen by ballot of the council, whom then make a decision on the objection by majority vote. Candidates are also allowed to withdraw from an election with the same deadlines under the objection process, and withdrawals must be submitted in writing to the county auditor or des designated city clerk. I'll now cover uh, some post-election requirements and duties, and one thing cities should understand is how winners of elections are determined which at times is not as easy to figure out as it may seem. As detailed earlier, if a primary election is used, those receiving the most votes at the primary move on to the regular election. One important note here is that anyone who wins a primary election via write-in votes must file an affidavit of candidacy in order to be added to the regular election ballot. For regular elections with no runoff provisions, the candidate with the most votes wins, which is what happens in the, in the vast majority of races. If there is a tie vote, the County Board of Super, Supervisors is directed to draw lots to determine the winner. Also, any write-in winners for the regular elections with no uh, runoff provisions are considered the winner of the seat and no affidavit of candidacy is necessary. Now, if a write-in winner wishes to, to uh, decline the seat, they must submit that in writing to the city clerk. The clerk is then directed to notify the next highest vote getter. If that person also declines the seat, the seat is considered vacant and the council may fill it by appointment or special election. For cities with runoff elections, winners must receive a majority of votes cast at the regular election. For a one seat race, it's pretty straightforward. The majority is 50% of the votes plus one. For two or more seats, the math is a little more complicated. A majority is calculated by taking the total votes cast, divided by the number of seats, divided by two plus one. If, if a majority is not achieved through that fund math, a runoff election is held a month after the regular election. Any write-in candidates from the regular, regular election must then file an affidavit of candidacy to be placed on the runoff election ballot. A couple other things to keep in mind. After the election, the county auditor will send Canvas results and materials to the, to the city clerk certifying the election. The terms of office following, following a regular city election begin on the first day of January that is not a Sunday or legal holiday, which in 2018 is January 2nd. Also, the state, rec the state code requires all elected officials, whether newly elected or re-elected, to take the oath of office prior to the beginning of the new term. The oath can be taken any time after election results are certified and the new term begins. Some, some cities do this as a formal ceremony, which can be fun for the council member and his or her family. However, the oath does not have to be part of any official ceremony or city council meeting. It simply needs to be done prior to the member beginning duties. I'm gonna switch gears now to council vacancies, which can occur any time of year and do not always require an election. However, we do get a bunch of questions from cities on this topic, so we'll go over the process to fill a vacancy on the council. First, the state code allows cities to fill a vacancy by appointment or special election. Most cities choose to fill vacancies by appointment as they are quicker and cheaper in most cases than going through a, a, a special election. Cities have 60 days under the appointment process and must first pub publish a notice of intent to fill the vacancy by appointment no less than four and no more than 20 days before the meeting where the appointment will be made. The notice must also include a statement that the citizens have the right to petition for a special election within 14 days of the appointment. If that occurs, then obviously the city will need to work with the county auditor to get that special election scheduled 
to fill the vacancy. The appointee then serves until the next city election, whether it's the regular city election or an intervening special election. The city must also notify the county auditor of the vacancy and the council decision on how it will be filled. The city should also notify the auditor of the appointee after the appointment is made. If an, if an appointment is not approved within 60 days, the county auditor must call for a special ele election to fill the vacancy. The special election must be held at the earliest practicable date, but no sooner than 32 days after receiving notice from the city clerk. A special election may also be used to fill a council vacancy, as well as for public referendums, or both in some cases. When a special election is used to fill a council vacancy, the election must be held within 90 days of the vacancy. For these types of special elections, any Tuesday can be used except for three weeks before and after a regular primary election, a day where other elections are being held that includes the same voters from the city, or at the general election for primary election cities. The city is required to provide notice to the county auditor in order to use a special election to fill a vacancy, and the winner must must take the oath of office within 10 days of the canvas of votes. Now, if a special election is needed for a public referendum, any appointed seats must go on the ballot as well. This is important to note, as many cities make appointments to fill vacancies at different times of the year, and when a special election may pop up, it's, they need to add that appointed seat to that special election ballot. The state code permits special elections for public referendums to be held at four times of the year in March, May, August, and November. Cities are encouraged to work with their county auditor to determine when a special election can be called for a public referendum. Also, the state code requires the city to deliver the full text of the referendum, which again speaks to the need to communicate plans with the auditor. We'll wrap up with some campaign laws that are important for candidates and current city officials to know. First, candidates, candidates, candidates are required to form a committee and file a statement of organization with the Iowa Ethics and Campaign Disclosure Board within 10 days of receiving contributions, incurring debt, or making expenditures in excess of $1,000. Candidates must also file campaign disclosure reports as necessary on or before the appropriate deadlines. Another law requires candidates to include attribution statements, often referred to as paid for by statements, on any political advertising and include the official name of the campaign organization. If no organization has been formed, then the statement, statement must include the candidate's name and address. There are a couple exemptions to this that are noteworthy, including any yard sign in a residential yard that is 32 square feet or less, as well as any items that are too small to include the statement, such as pens or buttons. Another issue that comes up during campaign season is the proper placement of campaign signs, which cannot be placed on corporate property or governmental property, which includes the city right-of-way in the area between a sidewalk and a street. This can be challenging to manage at times, but cities must do what they can to enforce this law. And finally, a really important law for all to understand is that no city funds or resources can be used for political purposes. Candidates cannot accept or use any public money for campaign or political purposes, and city resources cannot be used to advocate for or against a candidate for office or a ballot issue. This includes city materials or communications, such as mail, email, website, newsletters, utility billing, statements, social media, and probably a whole lot more these days. Keep in mind, this does not prevent a city from making an announcements of the upcoming city election or providing information to candidates and the public about the election. This also does not uh, prevent candidates from, uh, or current city officials from conducting campaign activities, but they just cannot use any city resources when doing so. And then finally here, we have some resources of, that are really helpful to cities um, for going through the city campaign and election season. As I mentioned before, the Secretary of State's office has some great guidance materials on city elections. The Iowa Ethics and Campaign Disclosure Board is another helpful office that provides information on campaign laws as well as housing uh, the campaign disclosure reports. 
The League, of course, also has a bunch of election resources, including our 2017 City Candidates Guide. And then finally, county auditors across the state play a key role in the local elections and can help ensure your election goes well. That concludes our Municipal Elections Guidance webinar. I hope you find this beneficial. And as always, please contact the League with any questions. Thanks.